Hello, Bengals fans. My name is Matt Minnick, and this is Chalk Talk. Obviously, everybody is very excited about Joe Burrow, but, you know, when you've got nice things, you got to worry about keeping them safe. And with that in mind, today I am joined by Bengals assistant offensive line coach Ben Martin. Coach Martin, how are you today? I'm doing great, Matt. Thanks so much for having me on the sh- on your show here tonight, and uh, look forward to answering any questions I can. Yeah, I appreciate you uh, you taking the time. I know uh, you know things are about to get heated up. Uh, we're, we've all got our our fingers crossed that uh, training camp is going to start start on schedule, and uh, we'll we'll get everybody out there, get all those physicals passed, and uh, everybody finally signed and out there on the field. So. Now, you coach the offensive line alongside Jim Turner. Um, so how does that dynamic work? Does one of you focus specifically on, on tackles, the other interior guys? Do you kind of – one of you watches the left side in practice, one of you watches the right side? How, how do you work that? You know, I think having the relationship I do with Jimmy and having the experience of working with him for multiple years at Texas A&M um, and then just – having gaining my own experience through other stops in, in in between us coming back here together at Cincinnati, that first experience was the most useful for me, right? It, it lets me understand the things he's looking for, helps me understand what he's looking for, particularly with what you're saying, what we're looking at. Uh, but even small stuff of here's what he expects on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And now I can get those things to him, hopefully, before he would even ask, uh, just so that we can expedite the process that we have. And that process, because of the relationship, is very streamlined. It's very open. It's truly all, honestly, it's, it's both of us coming together and saying, here's, our, here's the strengths this week. Here's the weaknesses this week. Here's the strengths and weaknesses on a given day for a particular lineman, whoever it may be, and what's the best way to attack that. Is is a Jimmy going to approach that player? Is a Jimmy approaching Coach Callahan with a new scheme idea or what have you? Those things don't matter when you have the relationships uh, that you want to surround yourself with. And and I truly believe that Jimmy and I have an outstanding relationship, and uh, it's been a pleasure working with him once again. So versatility is something that's uh, very important on the offensive line. How do you go about cross-training players to play multiple positions? I think the, there's a stigmata to that, and that is that certain people can't do it, right? I'm only a left guard, a player could tell me in my past, right? Or I only play center, or I've never played center. I've never snapped the ball in a game. I've only snapped the ball during practice. And, you know, I think it starts with building confidence within the players, and, and really that's the main thing we try to do is get these players believing in themselves and believing in the people around them no matter who may be to the left or to the right of them. So in, in getting that confidence going that, hey, you can snap the football. Let's just give it a couple more reps. Let's build that into your practice plan for us. Uh, we'll sub you in there to get those reps and see how you do maybe in a preseason game from that development standpoint when you're just talking about center. But I think without the confidence of saying, what's the difference between center, left guard, and right guard, uh, you know, you, that player is going to be even more hesitant about a switch like that or just being less open-minded than maybe we would want him to be. So I think it goes from a cross-training standpoint right from day one, lining up in multiple stances, something that these all players should be doing over, the, over their summer months right now of just left-handed, right-handed, and firing off the football and using those reps to build that confidence within themselves. And then it's our job to foster that confidence and then to truly say – you work better with him, he's a better right tackle, therefore will you play right guard. And treating it as that game of chess is always the best way to do it. It's impossible to do it if the player does not have confidence in his own ability or comfortable with his confidence level to do it. And we want to always put these players in a position to have that confidence high so that they have the best chance to succeed. Kind of on, on that note or related note here, uh, Fred Johnson came in midseason from the Steelers. He had been playing guard in Pittsburgh. Jonah Williams, Hakeem Adeniji, uh, both draft picks for the Bengals at off the tackle in the last couple of years, but who some in the draft community had kind of projected as, as guys that might have to play guard in the NFL. Do you think that the way you evaluate offensive linemen is different 
uh, than, than other teams in terms of who's capable of, of playing guard versus tackle? I think what any evaluator is looking for is certain intangibles, obviously the physical speed, the strength, and the sort of stereotypical things. But there's one thing that tape always speaks very loudly to people like me and Jim Turner is character. You are who you put on that tape, and watching and evaluating that person's character, how physical they play, how hungry they are, their effort, all kind of equals that character. And he may have a flaw with his first step in pass pro or a punch in the run game, whatever that flaw may be. We would say because he's physical, because he's hungry, we get to know him. He's an accountable individual. That, to me, is a very powerful driving force in the evaluation tools uh, that we have. Yes, the pros and cons to his actual intangibles, his strength, his foot speed, what have you, his actual technique, though some of those things can be corrected, some things can't. But without the desire to correct it and without the working attitude that I can get this right and I can be better every day, I can be better, uh, that to me is what's really spoken on volumes. When a player is playing, who he is is all divulged on that film as well as his strengths and his weaknesses. So uh, looking for that character on tape and finding that, reading between the lines of his play, what's that first quarter look like? Well, great, we love the first quarter. That was unbelievable. Let's look at the fourth quarter and see if that has dipped or has it, gotten, is it has that competitive drive and uh, physicality increased, right? So uh, I think that is the, one of the main things that can go into evaluating any player at any level is just their willingness to get their heads in there and, and do the job. There's been a lot of talk uh, about how intelligent this offensive line is, and, and really seems like that's, those are the types of players that you're, you're trying to bring in. You've got Trey Hopkins, Fred Johnson, Jonah Williams, all really known for how studious they are, how they attack the game before the game, you know, before they even get on the field. Uh, Hakeem Adeniji, uh, the offensive tackle that was drafted this year, uh, has also been mentioned as somebody who's extremely intelligent. Xavier Suofilo is a guy who yeah. you watch him on film and you see the way he picks up stunts, the way he picks up blitzes. You can tell that he processes very quickly. So how important is it for an offensive lineman to be really smart, to be able to process things quickly on the field? It's, it, I think it's one of the most demanding th- positions in all of sports to actually do all that because – Yes, quarterback is talked about, and that quarterback intellect is obviously superior as well. I'm not taking anything away from any of that. But at the same time, the decisions that are happening uh, are foot apart from you now. But when you look at an O-lineman and a D-lineman, and if if we don't have enough smart enough players to be able to communicate just verbally of what happened, right, Uh, being able to talk about that is so much more streamlined for us with smarter players, meaning I don't have to draw it up and walk somebody through it when we're just talking about a simple three technique slanting into the A-gap. Hey, when they stunt like this, we have to do X, Y, Z. Having those conversations is, I think, really developed over the course of the year, uh, which was hopefully evident in our play, but it really starts everything. Without having those conversations, you can't quickly identify the issue and correct the issue. If you have players that can't handle that, you have to draw. There's, it's not saying it's impossible to get it done, but it's just going to take an extra step. I have to draw it on the whiteboard. I have to walk that player through it, what have you. Uh, so intellect starts there. And then when you look at it, like I mentioned, everything's only a seven, 17 inches at the most to a foot away from you when these things have to happen and these decisions need to be made. That decision that one individual is making is affecting somebody else to either side of him. But if we can't effectively communicate that and process that in our brain, it just makes it a little bit tougher for everybody involved. So having the intellect that we do, starting with some people like Trey, Freddie, Jonah, obviously I can't wait to just have more of those conversations with all those guys because where we were talking about that from week one last year to week 17 was night and day on our end of it, and I'm sure – to their end to some degree as well. And that's one thing that is going to be critical uh, in our development this year is, what, is how quickly can we manage these issues, talk about these issues, and get them corrected uh, so that way when we go play a game, I can't be communicating those things to you from the booth or Jimmy can't from the field 
they now have a toolbox of information that they can whip out in that split second and do whatever they need to do to succeed versus that player who may be bigger, faster, or stronger than they are at that time. It's about creating that intellectual toolbox so these players can use whatever is applicable at that moment to correct themselves during the drive not in between the drives, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Paul Vayner Jr. did a piece for The Athletic not too long ago about the Bengals' off-season program. Obviously, like everything else in the world right now, it was different this year. Um, yeah. And there's a very interesting piece talking about how the entire offense would be on this giant Zoom call or whatever, whatever you're using, uh, but that everybody was muted except – Joe Burrow and Trey Hopkins, so they could communicate, check, splits, pick up, all that sort of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. How did the offensive line meetings go? Was it, is it a similar dynamic, similar setup with the offensive line specifically? Absolutely. And so we would watch film, and, and kind of everything does start from the center position because it's affecting who's making what call on the front side and then conversing on the back side of a particular run play or pass protection. But I, I really think that this offseason program – it really provided us the opportunity to do what we just talked about. And that's because it's everything's so verbal and we're communicating that. And oftentimes there's film showing up. You can't see everybody's face on a zoom call. That communication process that I just described was sped up for us. And I'm really looking forward to see how that translates into a great start to the season, a great start to training camp here next week because it forced us to do the things we're trying to do anyway. And that is effectively communicate what's happening to us and be, while being accountable for what's going on and the, what that player did, it has given us a little bit of a ramping up of that. It has communicated to the rookie class as well. Like this is important how we communicate. And it really just forced the things we're trying to do within that room of communication, right? Um, and getting everybody on the same page. And, and just that communication going through it from the center standpoint, then a guard on the front side, and then a guard or a tackle on the back side, has really put everybody on the same page because they've had to communicate the things they'd be thinking about or saying, mumbling to the guard next to them. They have to communicate that now in front of the whole, in front of the whole room. And it's been a very powerful way to hold each player, us as coaches, accountable to each other, so that the message is always the same. So you mentioned the improvement over the course of last year, and you know, no place is more obvious than, than with the offensive line. You look at the beginning half of the year, there, there was a struggle to be able to run the ball. Uh, halfway through the year, famously, uh, you guys all got together uh, on the plane coming back from, from London and changed a lot of what you were doing offensively. Uh, went to a lot more polling plays, specifically toss. There's about five times as many tosses in the second half of the season. Uh, also a lot of power, some uh, inside or outside zone, you know, at, at higher rates than what was uh, previously being done. So really a lot of things that are having different impacts on the edge player from zone blocks, kickouts, down blocks, all sorts of things. Uh, and in the second half of the season, uh, sixth in the league in rushing. So, Big change, uh, big difference when those things came into play. How did the decision to make those changes come about? You know, what was the idea behind this will make us more successful, this is where we need to go to, uh, to have the success we want to have? I think to start off, having worked with many different co- levels of football and many different, uh, you know, from the NFL to Division three to so on and so forth, without relationships in the building on the offensive side of the ball, particularly that can handle that banter of back and forth and handle the pros and cons of what we are doing today versus what we want to be doing now, those, without those relationships, it becomes difficult, right? And uh, to Brian Callahan to, uh, and, and Zach, too, it, it, we all kind of got together and said, let's just go forward. And forward means this, this, and this. And not saying that what we were doing before was bad. There's still a place for it. But at this point, we can say, for whatever reason, maybe that confidence isn't there. Uh, When we're looking at it, Jimmy and I, or what have you, or the players saying, hey, let's just go forward. And we just started going forward. It was literally that simple and saying, how do we get not a 25-yard run? How do we get a five-yard run? How do we get a four-yard run? How do we get four, five, three, two, two, so that you can pop? an 18-yarder, right? And, and just building that consistency of going forward 
really got the ball rolling for us. And then once that ball's rolling, because of the relationships, you can build off of those ideas, get creative, say, and pull things out of the grab bag, whether it was Brian's experience at Detroit or Jimmy's experience at Texas A&M, and say, yes, that's going to work great this week. So the testament to the relationships, the people in the building, from Zach, Brian, Jimmy, myself, just – saying let's go forward and then having the creativity and the relationships again to take the next step to say we've been running a lot of these toss plays we've been running a lot of these tackle pull plays what's the next complement to that to attack the defense so um in the short of it, it without the relationships that we've developed over our time coaching football and specifically here with the bengals none of it would have been possible in a recent interview jim turner said that uh fred johnson the week that he was preparing to start uh, basically, the two of you were hands off with him. Uh, <laughs> that he, he told Dave Laffin that you didn't want to screw him up. You didn't want him to get too tight. Uh, do you find that that is a, a challenge you face with a lot of rookies, or is it particularly because it's a it's a smarter guy like like Fred that you had that uh, that approach? At some point, based off our evaluation, everything about Freddie was physical, was hungry, right, and and that character was showing up on the tape we were watching, whether it was in college or Pittsburgh. So at some point these guys have to go out and produce, right? And and he was at that stage of his development where it was time we both took a step back and let him just start showing up and gain that consistency, gain that competitive edge and that confidence needed to take the steps he did towards the end of the year. And uh, I trust that he's been doing that right now and, and very much looking forward to, hopefully staying away from them for 17 weeks this year, right? So, um, you know, it's a, it's a great thing when you have such talented players who are smart and dedicated to the game and it makes it that much easier uh, when you're 6'6 six, six and 330 or whatever he, Freddie is today, when you're just gifted with so much talent. Uh, he's, really shown, he's really shown up there at the end of the year, and I can't wait to see what he's been doing now uh, when we get him back next week. Well, he was definitely a, a bright spot at the end of the year and, and seeing him in the, those last couple of games, but also when he was getting plugged in at tight end in some of those games too. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of things to look forward to and, and hoping to see more of him this year. Uh, the other person that we're, we're hoping to see any of this year is, of course, Jonah Williams. Uh, so he's essentially a rookie this year that he didn't get to play last year, but obviously he was around. He was in your meetings. He's – Ben mentioned is, is such a studious guy that, you know, I'm sure he was breaking down uh, his opponents just like he was playing every week from everything I've heard about him. What are the expectations for, for him this year? Do you, do you see him as a rookie, or do you think he's a guy that can, that can come in and, and, you know, get past the, those rookie mistakes real fast? I think he's going to be able to uh, easily overcome any rookie mistakes he would have, right? I don't think he's looking at this season or, or we are saying that he's a rookie, uh, you know, just day in and day out. I was fortunate enough to witness the, the changes he's made to his body throughout the season. When he came in day one versus before we broke here uh, at the end of the year, his body physically matured and it's just a testament of everything you guys know about him, how studious he is, how smart he is, but he's that the way in the weight room as well. So that consistency in his character is going to lead to a tremendous amount of success, and we are very, very happy to be able to work with him this year. Thank you very much for your time, to Coach Martin. Uh, Bengals fans, I know you are all extremely excited to get this season underway uh, and see what this team can do and you know what they've – what they're able to do with the, the changes they've made uh, throughout the roster. Uh, so definitely exciting time to be a Bengals fan. If you are uh, somebody who loves offensive line play, uh, who, who's really interested in blocking schemes, things along that lines, uh, make sure you check out my video on Orange and Black Insider just posted last week. Breaks down the Bengals toss plays, the way they run it differently, to the tight end, away from the tight end, versus bare fronts, things along those lines. Uh, so definitely check that out and keep coming back here. And we will keep bringing on great guests like Coach Martin uh, throughout the rest of the offseason as we get underway. So thanks for uh, tuning in. and. Yeah.